Welcome to the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. We hope you enjoy the following quick take on international affairs while we all wait out the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Oslin, and I'm the Payson J. Treat Distinguished Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I'm a historian by training, and I used to teach history of Asia at Yale University before moving into the policy world. I actually live in Washington, DC. I work from there, though I'm affiliated with Stanford. And so I'm based both on the Atlantic and on the Pacific. But my work is focused solely on Asia, and particularly on the role of the United States in Asia. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today, America's role in Asia. And this is related to a new book that I published this year, entitled Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays in Reshaping the Indo-Pacific. For those of you living on the West Coast, I really don't have to tell you how important the Pacific world is, or Asia, or what we now call the Indo-Pacific. Believe it or not, for a lot of folks living on the East Coast who have a more Atlantic orientation and look towards Europe or maybe the Middle East, you actually have to make the case about why Asia is so important. Now, that's become a lot easier because of the rise in China, the threat from North Korea, our relationships with countries like Japan and Australia than it was in the past. But you still have to sometimes argue about why the United States in a very dangerous world, in a, in a world in which a lot of people just want to turn inwards and, and focus on, on the homeland, in a world in which there are constraints on our resources, why we actually need to remain even more engaged in Asia than before. And that's really the point of this book. The book is not a, a linear argument. It doesn't uh, take one uh, argument about the United States uh, playing a role in Asia and then develop that through chapters. Instead, what it does is take eight different essays, eight different looks at the world of the Indo-Pacific and how it's changing. Some of those are historical chapters. Some of those are very contemporary. Some, in some ways, don't even seem much to do with geopolitics. For example, a chapter on the role of Indian women and why the fact that they're not able to fully participate in uh, politics and economics and the like in India actually is a drain on the strength of, of India, which is, of course, as you know, the world's largest democracy and by now probably the world's most populous nation. Then there are other chapters that are more speculative, a chapter on why Kim Jong-un is not able to control his nuclear weapons, not because he's going to wake up one day and say, I want to nuke the Bay Area, but rather because controlling nuclear weapons, having a nuclear arsenal, is an extraordinarily difficult challenge for any state, the United States, the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, Russia. Um, lots of accidents can occur when you have a nuclear arsenal. You have to have a very well-trained force of nuclear technicians and nuclear launch officers. And we have no idea if North Korea will have any of that. So there's a chapter that looks at why the greatest danger of North Korea having nuclear weapons is not that they're going to decide to launch a nuclear war against us, but rather that they may not be able to safely control them and that an accident may instead wind up precipitating a larger war. There's also a chapter on Japan and why, if you remember back in the 1980s, we thought Japan was going to control the world. Why, when the, uh, the bubble, the economic bubble, the, the asset and property bubble in Japan burst in the 1980s, why Japan seemed to lag so far behind the rest of the world in the succeeding 30 years of uh, globalization, when in fact, what it was actually doing was making very distinct choices about how much it wanted to be engaged with the world, that instead of a, a Japan that for some reason couldn't uh, modernize like the rest of the United States or, or China or other countries, uh, that it had instead chosen specific barriers between itself and the world to protect things that it thought were more important. For example, a very unified homogenous culture, a unified homogenous population. Uh, a Japan that didn't necessarily want to open itself up to the wild west of uh, unrestrained capital flows and instead would accept certain economic inefficiencies in order to maintain a tighter income distribution across the population and create less underserved populations throughout uh, the Japanese archipelago. 
Uh, so a Japan that consciously chose what we would consider to be economic and, and indeed uh, globalization inefficiencies, but because it prized and, and privileged social stability and overall social uh, development across all of the sectors of Japan, rather than having a, a country in which there were some mega winners and some mega losers, which is actually more of a situation that describes China today than it does Japan. Meaning China is a country that we thought uh, everyone, all the boats were rising and that everyone was benefiting. But in fact, when you peel back the layers of what's happening in China, in fact, you see a country that is divided starkly by economic inefficiencies, starkly by winners and losers, starkly by political ins and those who have no chance of actually being part of the political process. This is the choice that Japan chose not to have. Um, there's other chapters in there as well that deal with the United States and the United States in Asia. We should remember that even though that we were a country born of European colonies, even though we focused on the Atlantic for probably you, one could even say the first 200 plus years of our existence as a nation, at the same time, we were always engaged with the Pacific world. In fact, the first American ship to sail to Asia, and it sailed, by the way, through the Atlantic, then into the Indian Ocean, and then up through what we consider Southeast Asia today, sailed from New York in 1784, just one year after the United States had signed a peace treaty with Great Britain, guaranteeing our independence. And the first American ship to actually go into the Pacific Ocean that is, it sailed down the eastern coast of the United States and South America, then around Cape Horn, up into the Pacific Ocean along the western coast of South America, the west coast of the United States, up to the northwest, the northwest coast, then over to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii over to, to China, as well as Japan. That ship left in 1787, before we had a constitution, before we even had a president was actually under the old Articles of Confederation. And ever since then, the United States has remained engaged in the Pacific world. We are a Pacific power. We have had continuous exchange with the countries, the nations, the peoples of the Pacific for well over 200 years. And even though it's a, a current phrase that we use to describe our uh, policy goals for the Pacific, what we call a free and open Indo-Pacific, or what the Obama administration called a uh, rebalance to the Pacific. The truth is that the United States has had that strategic goal at least since the middle of the 1800s. In fact, when we sent our first ambassador, our first envoy to China in 1844, Caleb Cushing, we were arguing that the Pacific world as we understood it then should remain free and open, meaning that there should be no hegemon, that there should be no country that could prevent others from trading freely or visiting freely or sending missionaries or having any type of interchange with the nations of the Indo-Pacific that it wanted to. So it may be a phrase that we've just adopted in the past few years, maybe the past decade or so, but the policy is the same policy we followed for 150 years and, and more. In fact, you know, if you look at it, 180 years. Um, it was the genesis of the open door notes in 1900. It was the genesis of our engagement in the Pacific War during World War II and our commitments to treaty allies after that. There are several chapters in this book about Asia's new geopolitics, about the role of America through history and today, helping to ensure stability, helping to ensure an open network of free trading nations, promoting and supporting those countries that have adopted the very messy road of democracy. It wasn't so long ago, about 35 years or so, that you could look back at an Asia uh, that was much less democratic than it is today, in which there were not democratic regimes in South Korea or Taiwan or Mongolia uh, or Thailand or Indonesia, but a nation, uh, I'm sorry, a region in which the nations during the 1980s chose a democratic route, South Korea and Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand that struggles back and forth uh, with democracy. Um, all of this was occurring at the same time, of course, 
that China was beginning its extraordinary rise. And while America's attention became focused increasingly on China because of its economic heft, its political influence, and its military might, at the same time, we were able to work with a much greater variety of democratic partners and begin to uh, interact with them in increasingly democratically oriented organizations such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, not which every nation of that is a democracy, but in which the idea of sovereignty and equality and uh, democratically agreed to uh, principles uh, marks the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The East Asian Summit, in which Japan helped bring in India and Australia and New Zealand to make a democratic counterpart to China. Uh, other uh, organizations such as APEC, uh, which, which do not, again, all include, uh, include every nation in the uh, Asian region, but we attempt to include as many as we can, which are democratic, that give freedom of rights to minorities, to different genders, uh, to, uh, to different uh, groups within society, regardless of their caste, their religion, uh, their economic background. This is the type of Indo-Pacific that has developed over the past decades uh, that the United States has been a supporter of and a part of. But the geopolitics in the region are changing dramatically. We have seen it because of the rise of China. And if we thought for 40 years that China might become a more cooperative partner, a partner that would ultimately adopt some of the very, the, the very liberal ideas that had helped benefit it, such as open free trade, international law, respect for uh, sovereignty, freedom of navigation and the like, then in the past half decade or so, since the end of the Obama administration, we have come to realize that the bet we made on China was only half fulfilled. The greatest geopolitical challenge we face is a China that has become far stronger, uh, far more confident, far more integrated into the world, but one which increasingly does not share the liberal values that underpinned the very systems that allowed it to become so rich and become such a powerful political voice. Instead, we face a China that has become more repressive under the Communist Party and under its current General Secretary Xi Jinping. We face a China that has sought to undermine international institutions such as the World Health Organization or the International Civil Aviation Organization or even the uh, Human Rights Council on, uh, of uh, the UN. Instead of supporting them and attempting to create a world of greater transparency. We see a China that has made an element of its statecraft endemic espionage and cyber attacks on nations that include its greatest trading partners, such as the United States, Japan, Great Britain, the EU, and others. A country that has enriched itself in no small part because it, because it has stolen hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, and terabytes of information from its trading partners. This has been well documented over the past half decade. We also see a China that has built a military to intimidate and bully, if not outright threaten its neighbors, including Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, and others. Instead of using its great strength and its international political position to help create diplomatic agreements that everyone could come onto the same page with instead of creating a community of interests that sought to resolve territorial disputes that have been festering for decades. China has in instead attempted to use its military power to intimidate its neighbors, to get them to give up their claims. In some cases, it has outright taken territory from neighbors like the Philippines, building man-made islands in the South China Sea and militarizing them, destabilizing the balance of power. We've also seen a China that has used its economic weight and its political influence to intimidate nations around the world into self-censoring, into not criticizing China, into looking the other way at the imprisonment of a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. A China that has, we have to be frank about it, ended the freedoms of Hong Kong in just the space of a few months, violating its international treaties with Great Britain and its international pledges and intimidating the world into not criticizing it 
by claiming that anyone who seeks to undermine the Hong Kong government as a part of China can be considered guilty of treason and subversion and charged by Hong Kong and mainland courts. This is not the action of a country that is confident. It's not the action of a country that is seeking to uphold the system that allowed it to gain such wealth, such influence and such power. It's not the China that we wanted and it's not the situation that we wanted, but this is the great geopolitical challenge that we face. Both parties in the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans were coming to this conclusion based on different sides of the political spectrum. It's what you might call a great fusion of concern over the threats to American interests, to our partners and to the international system that the Communist Party of China causes to us or the threats that we face because of it. Um, regardless of who was going to be president in 2016, and I think regardless ultimately of who becomes president in 2021, Americans have unfortunately woken up to the fact that the China that they hoped they would be dealing with, a partner that was going to uphold liberal values is not the one that they face. And instead that they face a country that we have to now consider how we protect our interests from, how we create a reciprocal relationship. And if the Biden administration, as it looks like it will be a President Biden, if the Biden administration believes that it can go back to the way things were before 2016, even during the Obama administration, then it will find itself with an increasingly aggressive, increasingly truculent Beijing and China that seeks further to undermine liberal interests, not just the interests of the United States, but the interests of so many of the democratic and free nations around the world. This is what I call the new China rules in the book. The espionage, the intimidation, the propaganda campaigns, the self-censorship, the cyber attacks, the threatening military, the undermining of international institutions. We made the right attempt with China. We did the right thing back in the 1970s by trying to bring it into the global system after the chaos and the madness of the years of Mao Zedong. We did everything we could to raise China to a position diplomatically, economically, politically, and yes, even militarily, so that it could be a confident supporter of the international order. We weren't wrong to do that, but we were wrong not to check ourselves along the way, to do the due diligence to understand if the China that was actually emerging was the China that we thought we wanted, that we thought we were going to get and the China that we wanted to get. So now we're in a new era, a new generation, a new generation in which geopolitics is once again at the forefront of the challenges to American foreign policy. Whether we look at the One Belt, One Road of China, the initiative to link Eurasia through infrastructure and trade agreements and political arrangements, whether we look at their military goal of being able to dominate what are called the waters of the first island chain in Asia or the second island chain, we face a geographic and therefore a geopolitical challenge. We need an equivalent geostrategy in order to deal with a China that has clearly made a choice that it seeks to suborn international institutions. It seeks to pressure free countries instead of working with them. And we need to figure out the allies that are going to work with us in order not to contain China, not to try to prevent China from becoming wealthier, but stop China, prevent China from undermining the very order that has benefited all of us. And that has, by the way, prevented a systemic great power war, global great power war since 1945. The geopolitical flashpoints we have to look at include Taiwan, where Beijing has made no secret of its desire to incorporate Taiwan into the greater Chinese homeland. We have to do what we can to support the people of Hong Kong, replicating Hong Kong civil society outside of Hong Kong because there is no more freedom in Hong Kong. We have to support our friends and partners in the EU who face an enormous amount of economic and political pressure from Beijing. We have to support our friends and partners in Asia, starting with Japan, also South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, India, 
all of which have faced pressure, intimidation, and sometimes, in the case of, uh, of the Philippines, in the case of India, outright aggression from China over territorial disputes. This is not easy. No one thinks that this is going to be the work of a year or five years. It's the work of a generation. But if we don't do it, then the geopolitics of Asia, of the Indo-Pacific, will change permanently. They will change away from freedom, away from cooperation, away from international law and norms of behavior, and towards the old adage of might makes right. That, I would argue, is not the world that we want to live in. And so I'll finish by talking about the last chapter in this book, my book, Asia's New Geopolitics. It looks forward five years to a Sino-US war in the littoral waters of Asia. It's a history of a war that hasn't happened, but it's based on the headlines. It's based on things that already have happened. Collisions between US and Chinese military planes, collisions between Chinese patrol boats and its Navy and its Coast Guard and the navies and fishing fleets of other countries. It's based on the lack of a uh, cooperative working relationship between China and many of its neighbors and the worsening, the dramatic worsening of that relationship between China and the United States. It doesn't talk about the COVID crisis that began in Wuhan, China, because when I wrote the chapter, that hadn't happened. But all the rest of the lead up, the background, the historical background, if I can put it that way, to this chapter on what caused a war between China and the United States is drawn from the headlines. And it starts because of an accident. And it's the fact that neither Beijing nor Washington wants this war. But once they're engaged in it, they both realize that they're faced with two problems. The first problem is, how do you control the war so that it doesn't spin out of control and become a nuclear exchange? And secondly, how do you then defend your own interests so that you don't lose your position in Asia, which would be existential for China and would be a grievous blow to America's global position? And so the war is fought out on the seas and in the skies with aircraft carriers and fighter jets, with both sides doing their best to defeat each other and yet at the same time wary of escalating the war to where either will lose. I'd like you to read it, so I don't want to give you the end, but I'll give you a hint. And the hint is that the US doesn't win, we don't exactly lose, but at the end of this war, Asia changes forever. And the geopolitical condition of Asia is completely different from that which held for over 70 years from 1945. You don't have to read that chapter to see that that's actually already what's happening in Asia that the geopolitics of Asia have dramatically shifted over the past decade, that the open system that we helped support through our alliance system, through the forward basing of 300,000 American troops in Indo-Pacific Command that has upheld stability and security have nonetheless been trying to catch up with a geopolitical condition that's changing with the rise of China and of course the nuclearization of North Korea. So this book tries to capture all of that. It captures what I think is the greatest challenge for a President Biden, for a United States going forward through the 2020s. And that is maintaining stability. How do you maintain stability when the mechanisms that we have used seem no longer up to the job? How do you maintain stability when there are assertive and aggressive nations? What Thomas Jefferson, back in the 1780s called a world of predatory and aggressive empires that the United States as then a new young nation needed to try to defend itself from. A world in which we no longer live according to George Washington's dictum of avoiding entangling foreign alliances. We have many of those, but one in which prudential statecraft requires us to think very carefully as Americans, not as Democrats, not as Republicans, but as Americans, about what are the country's interests? What are American interests? Interest in defending the homeland, interest in ensuring that no aggressive hegemon controls critical and strategic areas of the globe, an interest in knowing that there is an open international system in which we as Americans, with our friends and partners, can go out and trade and interact and engage. 
that will not disappear tomorrow. It will not disappear simply because China becomes the largest economy on earth or that it becomes the second largest military. But it will disappear if we don't understand, unfortunately, that the values of the Communist Party of China, of the People's Republic of China, are antithetical to those of the liberal democratic world that we have built and helped defend. That's the geopolitical struggle. It's one that if we decide not to engage in it, we will find ourselves in a more dangerous, poorer, some more suspicious world. One in which our own freedom of action, our own ability to interact will be dramatically curtailed. And so I hope you'll maybe look at these essays. You'll, you'll read them. You'll take a look at why Japan remains unique at why India needs to allow its women to become more of a focus in its life. Uh, of why one of the great competitions is actually not between the United States and China, but between Japan and China. And ultimately, at the role of the United States stretching back centuries, but also stretching, stretching forward into the future. One in which our very imperfect, our very messy systems of consultative representative democracy, nonetheless, offer the best hopes for creating a world of stability, a world of prosperity, and a world of peace. So I'm Michael Oslin of the Hoover Institution. I appreciate you taking time to think about the geopolitical challenges in Asia. And I hope I'll see you again at some point and that you may take a look at the book. Thank you.